welcome to the first uh, Global Environmental Speaker Series talk for spring semester. I think that's right. Is that the first one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Steve Nash. Now, Steve Nash uh, began out in the West Coast, uh, California. He did a bachelor's of journalism in some international studies or interdisciplinary studies at uh, University of, Cal of San, at San Francisco State, and while working uh, as a beat reporter, uh, finished a, a master's of journalism at University of uh, California Berkeley. Uh, he came to the United came to University of Richmond in 1980. To, was it a department of journalism then? Program. A program, which yeah. eventually evolved into the department of journalism. So you've been involved in setting up a couple of things here. Uh, I first met uh, Steve in 1997 when I got here and found him to be a, just an invaluable colleague and mentor and somebody I've been extremely fortunate to call a friend. Uh, Steve and I have been many of the things that I am proudest about seeing get done here that I've been involved with could not have happened without my friend Steve uh, uh, getting me started. So he's a prolific author. The books that I know of, which is an incomplete list, include 1999, uh, Blue Ridge 2020, an owner's manual, which won the award from Southern Environmental Law for outstanding journalism for Southern environmental issues. But when you wrote it, you couldn't imagine that you were going to see 2020. <laughs> It's true. Uh, in 2007, a wonderful book on millipedes and moon tigers, science and policy in an age of extinction. And I think part of your research and getting ready for that involved one of our early papers of the first environmental studies uh, graduating class for their senior project. In fact, Steve was one of the members of the original environmental studies study group to investigate whether or not we should have something for environmental studies here at the University of Richmond, which eventually evolved into, yeah, we need a degree, which evolved into the program with a couple other founding members I'm seeing here. Um, so Steve was involved with that project all the way back then. Uh, another book, Virginia Climate Fever, which just came out in 2014 and won the American Institute of Physics Science Writing Award and I know from personal experience, was very influential at our state government. Uh, we saw the uh, Secretary of Natural Resources holding that book up at some of our meetings. He's here to talk about his most recent book, Grand Canyon for Sale. I just want to mention a couple other things. Steve is also a very active journalist for articles in newspapers and science magazines, as well as op-eds. It's something I'm particularly uh, impressed by is a recent uh, op-ed campaign on money in state government. And it's a great example of what more of our politics should be in that he is trying to hold our friends accountable, not attacking the other side, but talking to the people that we regard as our allies and saying, you need to do better on this. Uh, so if you could all join me in first, Silencing the phones. <laughs> and then join me in giving a warm welcome to my friend Steve Nash. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for that introduction, Peter. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to begin talking this afternoon by asking a really simple minded question. Uh, how many of you have been to a national park in the United States? Raise, raise your hand for me. Well, it's either unanimous or it's a, a heavy majority. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, as of the last time we counted, which was 2016, there were 331 million recreational visits to uh, one or another of the units of our national park system. Just for comparison, the population of the United States is 325 million. About a quarter of those visitors, however, were visitors from foreign countries because our national park system is, of course, considered a global treasure, not just something that's only uh, 
uh, only appreciated by people here in the United States. Um, th this is the iconic uh, Grand Teton National Park, and that's, that's one of the Tetons. It may be familiar to some of you. Here's a view from Plateau Point, a place called Plateau Point in Grand Canyon National Park. Well, I've written this book with a kind of a weird title. Um, it involves the national park system, but it also involves the rest of our federal public lands. And that's what I'll be talking to you about most of all this afternoon, the sort of context for our national park system. Grand Canyon for sale. Uh, everybody knows Grand Canyon's not for sale. It's always going to be there. It's a national park. We protect those things for eternity. Um, I'm going to make the case, though, this afternoon that actually the conflict between the uses of our public lands for private interests and private gain really mean that the future of places like Grand Canyon National Park, the rest of our national park system, are increasingly compromised. The boundaries between the public interest and private interests are really breaking down quickly, especially now. The rocks are always going to be there in Grand Canyon. It may always be a national park. I certainly hope so. Uh, that's a beautiful place, but the life within the Grand Canyon is under continual stress and the stresses are multiplying. And there is a lot of life in Grand Canyon, partly because um, it's so deep. Uh, uh, there are so many thousands of feet between the rims of Grand Canyon and the bottom where the Colorado River is that there are a lot of different ecosystems, depending on which scientists you consult, at least seven different ecosystems, and so a great variety of plants and animals and, of course, the natural systems that they sort of live within. Um, my outline for my remarks this afternoon is, uh, is this, that I want to give an overview of public lands because we are all, or most of us, are familiar with national parks, but not so much the other public lands that the national parks are part of. I want to talk about the future of the natural systems within the national parks. That's my focus is the, we can call them nature, we can call them wildlife, I'll call them any one of or all of those things. Basically, it's all the vegetables and all the animals that um, live along these public lands. And finally, I want to talk about the overlay, which is determining the future of national parks and public lands now, the political landscape that we're living within and that, um, that you're a part of. The question comes up, who owns our national park system and who owns all these public lands? And the answer is that if you're a United States citizen, you're sharing the ownership. You're one of the stewards of the future of these places. They belong to all of us. The parks um, first began in the 1870s. The first national park was Yellowstone, but the park system was declared just about 100 years ago in 1916. It was established by Congress. The system was established by Congress uh, with what's called the Organic Act, and the Organic Act reads this way. Uh, that the park system is to promote and regulate the use of our national parks and monuments. And actually, is that a bunch of red ink that you can't read? Yeah, it sure is. All right, well, <laughs> this red ink up here is national parks and monuments, and we'll explain a little more about that in a minute, um, for, by such means as will leave them unimpaired, a key word, unimpaired for future generations. When we began to worry about our natural environment more in a more focused way in about the 1970s, the question came up, well, what's happening to the life within our national parks? Are they doing okay? And one of the questions that grew out of that in the science research was, are our national parks as big as they are? Are they big enough to maintain a full list of all of the native species that belong there, a full list of the species that, of all kinds that were there uh, before Europeans um, settled on the American continent. William Newmark did a comparison of what the parks had been like, what those landscapes had been like, and what the species were that, uh, that made a living uh, in what are now the national parks, and then what they are now. And his answer to that question, are they large enough to sustain uh, everything without impairment into the future? His answer was no. If we think of the national park system as a, a, an arc bearing all of these native species into the future forever, uh, it's a leaky arc, and it isn't big enough for everything we want to maintain unimpaired. 
That's what his study found. Uh, in fact, he found that 84 mammals, that's just one class of, of the life within the parks, um, by the 1980s, 84 mammals that were known to have lived in the big parks in the United States and Canada uh, had disappeared, and half of them had disappeared since the parks were declared. Another, another example of that is Everglades National Park. Everglades was established in 1934. <clears throat> Since 1934, uh, the last tally that was taken found that 92% of all of the bird populations of Everglades National Park have disappeared. So we need more space, more protected living space for these species if indeed we want to keep those natural systems going. Here's what's missing from Grand Canyon. One in five of its mammals are gone. Uh, including some of what we call charismatic species. The wolves, the grizzly bears that used to live there, the southwestern river otters, which is a subspecies that's completely extinct, uh, and jaguars, which were still in the park as late as the 1930s. Um, and they haven't been reintroduced either. Fortunately, as I've mentioned, our national park system is part of a much larger system of public lands. There are several categories of these public lands, and I'll explain what they are. But keep in mind how large a part of our national landscape they are. They make up 28% of all of the American landmass. That's a million square miles. So the inky portions here are uh, telling us where public lands are. The, the brown ink is lands that are administered by a little known uh, federal agency, the Bureau of Land Management. The green parts are the national forest lands uh, administered by the U.S. Forest Service. And the, the relatively small blue portions are our national parks. Uh, and then there's some Fish and Wildlife Service lands thrown in. It's a little easier to see those um, apportionments here. The BLM lands are the biggest, 37% of that million square miles. So what is that, 370,000 square miles. The National Forests, a close second, 35%. Um, our Fish and Wildlife is 14%, is, uh, those refuges. And the National Parks are only 12% of the whole portfolio of public lands. I want to use a term that uh, I know you've heard before, but I want to explain it a little further, because I find that most of my friends and acquaintances have a different idea of what a national monument is than and you'll remember it's on the list of things that are supposed to be conserved into the future. Uh, National Monument we usually think of as human-made, a solitary commemoration of some kind, a, a landmark like the Washington Monument. Uh, within our system of National Monuments, there are also natural features. The very first National Monument was Devil's Tower. It was declared by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1906. Actually, that was before the national park system um, cropped up 10 years later. Devil's Tower is a wonderful place with some land around it, but neither of these, the Washington Monument and Devil's Tower, are characteristic of national monuments. Our national monuments are, in fact, big, sprawling areas of land. Uh, they're administered by all four of those agencies that I mentioned, sometimes on a collaborative basis. But the thing to keep in mind is that they total more than 27,000 square miles if you push them all together. Uh, those are the terrestrial national monuments. There are enormous marine national monuments uh, out in the oceans that I'm not going to discuss today. But just for comparison, uh, these national monuments uh, thought of all together are uh, more than half the size of the state of Virginia. And the largest of them is a place called Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, which is in southeastern Utah. It's about 3,000 square miles. It takes a couple of days to drive across it at speed. I want to pause for a moment and talk about all of these categories of federal land. It can get kind of confusing, but I want to pick out one differentiation among them, and that is what are the levels of protection that the natural life within these federal lands enjoys. The highest levels of protection are found, just like you'd expect, in our national parks and in our wilderness areas. Wilderness areas are a whole separate system, and they are declared one by one by Congress, by vote of Congress. Well, 
We know national parks have this high level of protection, but we also know national parks are full of roads and cars and hotels and places to live and administrative buildings. It's not as if nature is the only thing in our national parks. The idea here is that, um, that they are prioritized. And it's the same in wilderness areas. Uh, it happens occasionally that wilderness areas are uh, the subject of exploration for gas and oil, so there's drilling sometimes, and uh, there's cattle grazing in wilderness areas. So none of these are an absolute system, but that's the first category, the highest level of protection. The second category are usually referred to as multiple use lands. And there are a lot of these uses, um, industrial uses. You, here's a pump jack on uh, some Bureau of Land Management land near Vernal, Utah. Uh, gas and oil is a common thing that uh, public lands are leased out for. Here's the canyon mine near the south rim of Grand Canyon. It's on National Forest Service land. It's a uranium mine. Um, unfortunately, it has filled with water and it's leaking radioactive contamination uh, in ways that we're not quite clear where they're going, but some of that contaminated water might wind up in Grand Canyon. Uh, it's an example of how some of these multiple uses can make incursions and undermine the, um, undermine the durability of others. Um, then there's logging. Our national forests have always been open to logging. Sometimes it's called timber harvesting uh, since they were created uh, in the last century. And finally, a uh, very prominent use of our public lands, including some in the national parks, surprisingly, is uh, that we lease public lands out for grazing cattle. I'm gonna dwell on the cows on our public lands a little bit this afternoon. First of all, because I don't think most of us, I certainly didn't realize, first of all, that there are um, cattle on public lands, uh, a great ex extensive amount of public lands. And second, because a lot of good research has been done on the impact that cattle grazing has on natural systems that most of us never get to hear much about. This is a scene on the approach road through the Kaibab National Forest on the way to the north rim of Grand Canyon. Uh, and you do have to watch out that you don't run into a cow um, on the way to that national park, a lot of it. Multiple use lands include national monuments, which have some protections built in, but still have a lot of industrial uses, the wildlife refuges and the national forests. And then finally, the least protected are what I would call undesignated federal lands. But these aren't just throwaway places. Uh, here's an example. Some of them are absolutely magnificent, and they are open to recreational use, uh, hiking and backpacking and rock climbing and all of the kinds of recreation that um, Americans like to do. But they are open, more open than all of the rest of those categories to industrial uses. All right, here come the cows. This is a map of public lands grazing. Again, these are federal lands that you and I all hold the deeds of trust to. The green ink here shows you national forest lands that are open to cattle grazing, and the brown is uh, Bureau of Land Management. Um, the, the total here is 348,000 square miles of land open to grazing. A lot of this is arid or semi-arid, very, uh, very dry, usually pretty hot environment. And here they are now. A couple of things to remember about cattle that interested me. The first thing is that if we got rid of all of the cattle on federal public lands, if we just declared that they don't belong there anymore for whatever reason, uh, you might well ask, well, okay, but what's that gonna do to the price of a cheeseburger? or a filet mignon? And the answer is absolutely nothing. All of the cattle over that 348,000 square miles of public land grazing land, um, all of them account for 1% of our national beef supply. So if you're into beef, um, you needn't worry that something like that might happen. This is a picture of some public lands grazing. Just a few features of this one photo to take in mind. You, uh, to keep in mind, you can see that um, there is natural vegetation in the foreground and outside the fenced area, and you can also see that inside the fenced area, the land has been grazed down to um, just about to bare dirt. Water's very precious commodity anywhere, but especially in the arid west where most of these public grazing lands are, and cattle are not native species. They didn't, uh, they weren't here when European settlers arrived. They were brought in, 
As a result, they're not used to these lands and they need water. Uh, a cow will drink 30 to 35 gallons of water a day and that's if it's not too hot and if it's not lactating. Uh, under those conditions, they'll drink even more. So they're always congregating around these very scarce water sources. And what happens, of course, is that they erode and trample the stream banks. So the streams fill up with silt. Uh, they also fill up with cow poop. And the result of that is that a lot of aquatic species that depend on unpolluted water uh, disappear rapidly from these grazed lands. This is a, a guy um, I would refer to as a modern cowboy. Cowboys hold a special place in our national consciousness. If you're um, like me, you sort of grew up watching them on TV. They mean a lot of good things to us, these cowboys. Uh, this is a, a rancher who leases public land and runs his cattle on a pretty big ranch near Sholo, Arizona, high elevation ranch. And he's a good guy. And he's a hard working guy. He's physically competent. He cares about the condition of his land, uh, at least within the limits of the business that he has to, the living he has to make out of them. Um, and his family's been on this land for more than 100 years. They're in their fifth generation now. So you can imagine that although these lands belong to you and me, and he's just the leaseholder, that he uh, thinks of these lands and he tells his children about these lands as if they really belong to him. He knows they don't, and yet, by right of having been there for a very long time and worked the land for a very long time, um, he, f he feels like the possessor of these lands. Uh, Orville Bundy is uh, another public lands rancher. He's in northern Arizona and southern Utah. I spent an afternoon with him and his son Bill Bundy. A couple of things to point out about these people is that none of them actually make their living off their ranch. They make some income but it has to be propped up. Bill Bundy here was a delivery truck driver for um, all of his working life, and his father did other things too to supplement that income. These are people who are in many ways admirable, whatever um, disparagement I'm going to offer their cattle in the next few minutes, but I want you to, to, to think of them that way. Uh, they lease public lands, they are ranchers, but they are not typical of the people who really control the majority of these lands by any means. I was able through a couple of Freedom of Information Act requests to get some data um, that I couldn't find any place else to answer the question, who's really controlling most of this 348,000 square miles? And what I found was that there are about 15,000 individual leases of grazing land that are held by corporations and private individuals. The top 1% of these 15,000 people the, and corporations, the top 1%, just 152 people, control a third of that grazing land, the BLM grazing land. This is David and Charles Koch. They are among the people who lease federal land for cattle grazing. Um, these people spend tens of millions of dollars influencing our political system. They're both on Forbes magazine's list of the 10 wealthiest people on the planet. At last count, each of them was worth $35 billion. This is the 1%, or they're among the 1%, of a of short list of millionaires and billionaires that really, are, um, that really are the proprietors of these cattle grazing leases. These guys also have extensive gas and oil leases. It's, it's worth remembering the subsidies that you and I are paying, the Koch brothers and everybody else who leases federal land. The program that administers cattle grazing leases costs six times more than the income that we get from those leases. The ranchers who lease the land pay a fraction of the cost to graze their cattle on these lands that they would pay if they were dealing with a private landowner. And the Koch brothers are the beneficiaries of that subsidy they and the rest of that 1% far more than um, the cowboys that we saw in the, in the earlier frames. The next 5% of leaseholders control the next third of that enormous quantity of land, about 77,000 square miles in each of those categories. And then, here are the cowboys. They make up 90% of the leases, but they only control a third of this federal land. A very, very pronounced concentration of ownership of these leases. Uh, 
uh, in a very few hands. The next question we want to ask if we're concerned about the natural life on these public lands is, well, what's the impact of the cattle? How healthy are these lands? This is a map of the Bureau of Land Management grazed lands. The red ink is land that's unhealthy because of grazing by the standards that the BLM has. Uh, the yellow ink is land that's doing okay. Uh, it's, it's healthy enough by, um, by their measures. The gray land is, is interesting because um, it makes up, uh, I want to get this right, 38%, nearly 40% of all of the grazed land. And the BLM is telling us we don't really know what condition that land is in at all. We haven't been able to check or reach any conclusions. Here's a little easier way to look um, at that picture. The critics of the BLM stewardship of our public lands uh, say that this is much too optimistic a picture, by the way, of the way the land really looks. Well, uh, that's a conversation of one kind. What, what does science research tell us about the impact of grazing on our land? Um, let me back up just a half step. Thomas Fleischner uh, is an ecologist who teaches at Prescott College, and most of his career has been assessing the health of public lands, and a lot of it has to do with the impact of cattle grazing. For a peer-reviewed research journal called Conservation Biology, he pulled together an overview of a lot of the recent studies, and there are two or three dozen of them that have been done of grazing's impact on lands, and here's some of what they found. Cattle favor certain plants to eat and ignore others. But as you can see, they're competing with uh, natural wildlife heavily. And they cause a lot of damage. And they eat a lot. What happens when you, for one reason or another, remove cattle from these landscapes? If you're concerned about these natural systems, a lot of good things happen. Oops. And uh, the aquatic life comes back when the streams begin to clarify after the cattle are removed. Here's the bottom line from uh, Tom Fleischner about what this all means. That multiple use lands uh, are a kind of a pretense that we can graze cattle and have um, healthy populations of wild plants and animals that we can have coal mines and still expect that large mammals like wolves or jaguar or antelope can, uh, can do OK under those circumstances. His, his uh, research on cattle grazing tells us or begins to suggest very, very strongly that that's just not the case. That's what, what's missing from the multiple use scheme we've been uh, living with for quite some time on these federal public lands. What's missing is a sense of prioritization. We haven't decided which of these uses is more important. It's kind of been decided by default because some uses cancel out others. Let's move to another researcher. Uh, this is Robert Beshta, who is at the University of Oregon. He's also made a career of studying public lands, all kinds of different stressors on public lands. And this is what he has to say about grazing and also our next kind of subtopic. Grazing's a big stressor. It's been around for a long time. But another stressor is being laid on in the form of climate change. This is the most immediate and visible symptom of climate change on these western public lands, forest die-offs. Sometimes it's heat, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes it's drought, and sometimes it's insect infestation that are being uh, that are afflicting millions of acres of forest in our public lands out west. Um, often it's a combination of the three. It's a little difficult for forest ecologists to sort out which is the most important of them. This is either a preview of what these forests are going to look like under the influence of climate change, or it is climate change already happening. It depends on which of those uh, forest ecologists and other, other scientists and allied fields that you consult. Um, but the end result of forest die-offs is increasing numbers of forest fires. They're increasing in frequency and intensity. And the fire season is both beginning earlier and ending later. 
The National Forest Service used to spend less than a third of its budget on fighting fires. It's still a big chunk of the budget. It's now spending more than 50 percent, and it's been back to Congress several times in a kind of a, an emergency frame of mind because a lot of what the Forest Service does doesn't have to do with firefighting, uh, but now they're spending more and more of their budget on it and with less and less success. I don't want you to try to read these maps, just get an impressionistic view of the colors here. Um, the top frame is our legacy climate, which we've uh, enjoyed more or less for the last 8,000 years since the end of the, the last ice age. Um, these are the years 1971 through 2000. That's our benchmark climate. And these are western states where there are a lot of different national parks, um, including Glacier National Park up at the top of the frame and on down to the parks in, um, in Utah and uh, New Mexico. For comparison, we're looking now at climate projections uh, that take us to just past the middle of this century, around, uh, give or take, around the year 2065. And what it's telling us is that if we count the number of days, on average, that are 90 degrees or more, there are going to be a whole lot more of them in 2065 than there were at the end of the last century. Some of these national park lands are going to be seeing twice as many days over 90 degrees, and some of them three times as many. And that's just by 2065. I asked Sharmisa Swain and Catherine Hayhoe, who are two climate physicists at Texas Tech University, to draw up these comparisons. It used to be that we could only talk about climate change in in global terms or in hemispheric terms, or maybe we were talking about the North American continent, um, now we can project on a more localized or regionalized basis, and this is what is um, being told to us about national parks. Some more 90 degree days you and I can think of as, well, that's kind of uncomfortable, but it's something I can deal with. I'll take off clothes, or if it gets too cold, I'll put on clothes, or I'll reach over and turn on the car air conditioning. We have these sort of prosthetic devices for regulating temperatures. But think about the natural systems again, the plants and animals. What choices do they have when it begins to be more heat than they have evolved to tolerate? What can they do? Uh, the rather obvious answer is they can start moving north into more northerly and cooler climates, or in rarer cases, they can move upslope if there's elevation available because it's cooler when you go up higher. Here's another way of looking at the gathering heat. Uh, it's happening in Virginia, but it's also happening, especially in these arid regions out west, at a little, a little faster clip. This map was drawn up for me by Chris Zanjar, who's a climate scientist with the Nature Conservancy. And I, I hope you can read these. Yellowstone National Park is up in the northwest corner of Wyoming. By the middle of the century, under a business-as-usual scenario, meaning if we keep putting greenhouse gases into the air at the same rate we are now globally, um, Yellowstone is going to move south by nearly 300 miles, and by the end of the century, another couple of hundred miles. That's northeastern Utah and then southern Utah by the end of the century. As the climate is dislocated by the heat, dislocated to the south, animals who can figure out how to survive are going to have to migrate to the north. Plant life will have to move north also, but most plants aren't able to move this quickly. We'll have to see what happens. Some animals can't move that quickly either, but some of them can, bird life typically. Um, so the ability to migrate depends on a couple of things. One is, is is the animal or is the plant physically capable of moving its populations into cooler places? But the second thing is more under our control, and that is, is there room for that migration to take place? Are we protecting the areas that these plants and animals are going to need to move through as global warming kicks in? We're back with William Newmark, who now 30 or so years later is a curator at the Natural History Museum of Utah, and he's quite optimistic about that. What he's saying is that we are very fortunate to have at our disposal all of these public lands that we've been talking about, the national forests and the BLM lands and uh, 
and uh, the open undesignated lands, they're all available basically to turn into one big national park. If we protect those public lands at those levels and begin to prioritize that instead of industrialization, then um, he's optimistic that we can save most of those species and keep that arc that we wanted to have established in the national park system unimpaired. Uh, we can keep it on into the future, or at least it improves our odds of being able to do that. Um, here's a map drawn up by the Wildlands Network. It's one of several similar proposals. Um, it's a map that consolidates public lands and protects them. It starts in Saguaro National Park down near Tucson, Arizona on the Mexican border and goes all the way up to the Canadian border, Glacier National Park. Uh, it's just a rough outline, but it gives us an idea of what can happen if we make that our priority. Let's zoom into Grand Canyon, which is sort of our foreground example this afternoon. This proposal was for a Grand Canyon Heritage National Monument. And uh, if you can make it out, the Kaibab National Forest to the north and south of Grand Canyon is sort of glued onto the margins of Grand Canyon. And then a big national monument called Vermilion Cliffs. And then the Grand Canyon Staircase, uh, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument to the north. These are corridors that wildlife could move through um, as they need to migrate. This proposal was not accepted. The president didn't designate this national monument by the time um, President Obama left office uh, a year and, um, and a few weeks ago. Well, that's all nice, uh, but what's the reality? The reality is that, that, what, uh, that the agenda that's in control now is completely opposite. That agenda is for more industrialization, for more oil and gas drilling and logging and mining, and more grazing too. Um, that agenda is uh, expressed well in the Republican Party platform uh, during the presidential race of 2016. And what it says is that it's ridiculous for the federal government to have so much federal land that what we Americans ought to do is turn as much land as possible over to the states. And indeed, that process is underway. President Trump flew to Salt Lake City, Utah just uh, three or four weeks ago and proclaimed that two of our largest national monuments will have their boundaries redrawn. One of them I mentioned, Grand Sta Staircase Escalante National Monument on the left, and an adjacent one nearby in Utah, uh, Bears Ears National Monument. If you're more interested in industrialization of this landscape, you would really be heartened by what's taking place here. Bears Ears has 300 uranium claim, uranium uh, mining claims within these boundaries. Bears Ears was created at the end of the Obama administration. It's about 2,000 square miles of land that you and I own. Um, but there are not only hundreds of uranium claims, there are also uh, possibilities of oil and gas development, and there's cattle grazing and logging on this landscape, all of which would more or less come to a halt in a national monument. Ones that are already established might be grandfathered in. Grand Staircase over on the left has one of the nation's largest coal, largest remaining coal deposits on what's called the Kaiparowitz Plateau. Um, here is what the president was announcing. These are the new national monuments under his proclamation. Bears Ears has been reduced by 85% and Grand Staircase has been reduced by 50%. Now all of the uranium mines, the gas and oil deposits, the uh, coal deposits, and most of the logging um, are available for those uses, and the wildlife and other assets, uh, natural assets, and historical ones that were supposed to be protected by these uh, national monuments are no longer enjoying those levels of protection. Uh, I should add that Grand Staircase was created during the Clinton administration uh, 20 odd years ago. It's the largest rollback of federal land protection in the nation's history. That's the situation we find ourselves in now and that's the controlling uh, agenda. There are different ways of looking at this privatization, you could call it, where the resources instead of being public are now assigned to private uses. Uh, one is what's happened at Bears Ears uh, and Grand Staircase and also some other national monuments that I haven't mentioned this afternoon. 
Another is to move federal lands into state control, uh, as the Republican platform suggests ought to be done. And many of the states that have, an, have announced that if they gain control of these federal public lands, they want to sell many of them off uh, as quickly as they can. There's no question here that Grand Canyon National Park is going to be transferred to states or sold off, although that has been proposed in some state legislatures. Um, rather, it's those lands that are now national monuments or enjoy lesser levels of protection and less kind of public fixation uh, that might become part of this process, as several national monuments uh, already have. And there is already much more aggressive mining and oil and gas development on the undesignated lands, too, just, uh, just in the past year. Well, I don't want to make any assumptions about what your politics are or how you would prioritize these things, but just understand that that is the way the priority conversation is going, that the people who are controlling the agenda are the ones calling for these kinds of changes. The science research and the uh, folks who care about natural systems are not running the show. Um, I want to close by uh, letting a couple of people speak who I talked to extensively at Grand Canyon National Park. Although they echoed uh, the voices of the dozens of other uh, federal employees and independent and university-based scientists that I talked to, this is Martha Hahn. Martha Hahn was the top science administrator when I talked to her at Grand Canyon National Park. The interesting thing for me as a journalist here was that when I ask these people questions, I don't expect to get a straight answer. I don't mean that they tell me lies. I mean that when you're a mature, seasoned federal administrator in Grand Canyon National Park or any place in a federal bureaucracy, you don't make strong statements to journalists. You make diplomatic statements. You're a survivor. But the level of distress is so high that these people were, uh, for me, uh, amazingly candid. And so this is what Martha Hahn had to say about the future of Grand Canyon and other public lands. Basically, she is bouncing the ball back to you and I. This is our inheritance, the national park system, all the public lands that are going to be needed to, um, to keep the national parks alive, at least the living organisms within those parks. But it's sort of up to us to see what's going to happen to this legacy that we can pass on to the next generations. We got it because people in the past fought for these lands to be protected. The question she poses is, are we going to fight to make sure they're protected into the future? And finally, a very different guy, the sort of top dog when I was there at Grand, Nash, uh, Grand Canyon National Park talking to him. His name is Dave Ubaraga. He's not a scientist at all. He describes himself as a business guy. Um, he's the superintendent, or was the superintendent, at Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, he has a master of business degree from Yale. Um, another long timer in the Park Service, or he wouldn't have gotten as high as he did. And here's what he has to say. I grew up taking the National Park System for granted. It was something I got um, as part of the lucky club uh, that was born into uh, American citizenship without quite realizing that those struggles had taken place in previous generations to set public lands aside for public uses rather than private ones. But the message here is that if you guys want to have national parks, especially the living organisms within those national parks, the native species of all kinds, you're going to have to fight for them. That's also the message of a speaker in this series who visited a, a campus a few years ago, my favorite ecologist, David Orr. And what he was telling us was, you can't sit back and keep your fingers crossed or say a little prayer that things are going to turn out all right. Um, depending on where your priorities are, things may not be turning out all right for your national parks. Um, and you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and hope more actively and fight for them if you want them. Thank you very much for letting me bend your ear. Thank you. Yeah, questions. questions.
uh, let me uh, make a very brief commercial that the next Global Environmental Speakers uh, speaker talk is next week in Gottwald. Same time, but over in Gottwald. And that will be Stuart Marks, who is he here? No, he didn't quite make it. Uh, he will be talking about conservation in Africa and the need to integrate it with locals. Then we have a, uh, the next one's not till out in March, which relates to some of what you just heard about, a speaker named Hellman, who one of her research areas is assisted migration for trying to deal with climate. I'm so glad she's coming. That's and great. And then finally, on 19 March, that one will be over at BC 19 April, thank you, is a special event that we're doing together with VCU, and that speaker will be Gary Maklis, who was the chief science advisor to the National Park System. So again, relating to uh, this talk. So with that, would you entertain questions for I a bit? Sure will, thanks. Yes, sir. Um, have you had any contact with um, groups like NRBC uh, in terms of what they're doing and what their prognosis is for being able to legally uh, defend some of the things that have done in the past? <clears throat> the question is, have I been in touch with um, environmental groups to ask what their plans are and, and, and whether they're going to be fighting some of what's happening? Um, I know a little about what they're doing. I didn't tend to rely on them as source material for, for my research. I was looking for uh, people who had done science research or knew some of the history of these government regulations, but um, that's not to discount what their point of view is. Yes, at Bears Ears, for instance, and Grand Staircase, immediately Native American tribes, five of them, um, combined to file lawsuits, uh, and the burden of the lawsuits is that President Trump doesn't have the legal power to do these things. It's completely illegitimate. Uh, there were also several environmental groups that banded together and filed uh, two or three different lawsuits saying basically the same thing. Uh, so it depends on which environmental group we're talking about, what their strategy is. Some are looking to apply pressure um, outside of court and, and sometimes in court. Other questions? Yes. Steve, great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. I actually have three questions, but I know it would be unfair to ask them all. But if no one else has any more, please come back to me. Let me know the questions first, and I'll decide how many you can ask, Alice. <laughs> Yes. And how much control they actually have over what goes on on those public lands. Um, are there not uh, policies, criteria, and so forth that are supposed to be met uh, in order to, let's say, graze or drill or whatever? Are those just not being adhered to? Uh, so the question is, those four federal agencies that I mentioned, including the National Park Service, wh what are they doing? Are they following the law? Yes, but the law is an elastic substance, so it can be interpreted, it can be pressured into different shapes. Can they exert any leverage on behalf of what is obviously my favorite part of the agenda, the, the uh, natural life within these public lands? Yes, they can. Is it in their interests as human individuals within a bureaucracy to stand up and fight? No. In fact, what's in their interest is to play ball far more frequently with the private interests who want to have a different agenda for these lands. And if they don't sense a lot of strong public support, they will make way for the political uh, agenda that these people can exert. People who go to Congress and complain to a Congress or a congressional representative, I want this agency to get out of my way, wield a lot of power. And those people happen to be usually people who are 
uh, who have a private interest that they want served on the public land. People like us who have a different agenda, who want to preserve natural systems and make sure the national parks last on into the future and the other public lands, we can exert that kind of pressure too. But nobody pays us to do that. We have to volunteer for it. So yes, they're doing their jobs to a certain extent. Yes, we can rely on a certain amount of institutional momentum in the short term to protect some of this. But in fact, these agencies have been giving ground for, for decades. They can't defend these lands unless they have our political support. We can't ask them to be brave as individual bureaucrats and expect that they're gonna sacrifice a promotion or a paycheck or a career because they want to do the right thing. A few of them will do that, but most, most people within that kind of an employment context are looking over their shoulder and saying, do I have support for this or not? And the support now has been going steadily in the other direction. Other questions? Yes, back row. Yes. Do you find that science is being used as a counter argument and not the poor argument, or is all science and statistics <coughs> be off the table? It looks to me as if, there's a weasel phrase if I ever heard one, it looks to me as if um, science is still a very strong card to play because the current administration isn't the only game in town because we can see and hope for and work on a different future when science will be highly regarded in policy making again. So scientists who are able to present their research and speak up now are being paid close attention to by people who are involved in those battles, though they, they may not be empowered as much as um, people with a different agenda. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, the science is still important to do, and it will be listened to perhaps in the future, depending on who's uh, calling the shots. Yes? Um, I have an economics paper tomorrow, <laughs> and it's about essentially this. It's asking to form an argument about whether the government should allow for privatization of natural land because, you know, the economic yeah. benefits outweigh the, you know, environmental costs. Yes. And so what would you say to that? Um. <laughs> The first, th <laughs> the first thing I would say is that I've heard about this assignment at least three times today. <laughs> and that's fine. It's a, it's a great question. I think it's relatively easy uh, to make claims about how much money we can get out of a coal deposit or an oil deposit or a stand of timber. And it isn't so easy to make a claim about what a den of wolves is worth someplace in northern Arizona. It seems to frame the question in a way that says, oh, these are all spiritual values, but unfortunately we need this immediate economic return for a whole lot of economic reasons. What's forgotten about often in that conversation is the raw, evident economic value of our national parks. Um, there has been a calculation of what the national parks all by themselves, not the rest of the public lands I talk about, bring into our economies, local ones and, and the national economy, because of recreation, because of all of the other different non-impacting uses that we put them to. Those are worth tens of billions of dollars, and as a result, you hear from businesses that are involved in recreation, that are involved in outdoor um, activities of all kinds, when they see Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante and our other national lands imperiled like this, they are speaking up very forcefully. And along with the scientists and the environmentalists and anybody else who's concerned, um, they begin to make their weight felt. Uh, as I told somebody in class this morning, uh, uh, there's an outdoor trade industry that's held its annual and very lucrative 
uh, conference in Utah every year, and they're boycotting Utah now because of the state government's um, opposition to protecting public lands. Those dollars matter too, and indeed when you aggregate them, they may weigh a lot more than these fossil fuel deposits that, uh, that fewer of us <coughs> want to buy and burn now anyway. So that's part of an answer. Yes? Um, is, is the idea that we can't trust science as much as we thought we could? Is, is that what you mean? There's just, I don't, they just seem like, they're not, they don't, there's, it feels like there's a sentiment that they're two separate entities, or that, I don't know. It's a question I have no ready answer for. There's a predicament for scientists that if they take sides politically, we begin to have reason to doubt um, the objectivity of, of their science. I think scientists are finding their way behind the microphones more frequently now to speak out about what they know to be true. And the scientists that I talked to for this book are good examples of that. They are less and less concerned that somehow they'll be made to seem political if they speak out about their science research. So I'm hoping that that happens already. And yes, there are a, a, a fair fraction of Americans who have decided that science doesn't matter, that its conclusions can safely be ignored. <coughs> um, and that's just the political reality of the moment. Um, but there's nothing that says it can't change in a better direction. Scientists are beginning to, uh, well, have been for a long time, not just beginning uh, to be part of this fight also. Yes? Uh, I Yes. Um, and then in your talk, you talk about how you know, the Grand Canyon is more or less safe. Yellowstone is more or less safe. Shenandoah is more or less safe. It seems <coughs> more minor outlying, at least in terms of consciousness, yeah. public lands that are really getting affected. So do you think there's a danger that in our campaign for protection, we latch on to save Old Faithful, save you know El Capitan, and it's not that we somehow lose the fact and it will allow you know the powers that be to get away with Thank you for asking. The, the argument here is meant to be this, that Grand Canyon isn't safe and Yellowstone isn't safe. We watched Yellowstone in a half century move 300 miles south in terms of its climate. That means that everything that lives in Yellowstone is in jeopardy. Not the rocks, but everything else, unless it's somehow adapted to a great big increment of additional heat and maybe some more drought, who knows. Um, if we don't leave these public lands open and re reprioritize them away from industrial uses, Yellowstone's not safe and Grand Canyon isn't safe. So, um, yeah, so I, I hope that comes through loud and clear. Uh, it isn't just using Grand Canyon and then switching the argument. It's Grand Canyon that's, that's really uh, in peril because of climate change especially, but there are lots of other things that I didn't have time to address this afternoon, other stressors on all the national parks. This is the biggest one, so um, I thought I'd pay more attention. Yeah, hand up, yes. Um, what did you see to be like the working relationship between Native American groups in the area and the environmental advocacy people and like the level of respect that ecologists, et cetera, have for the Native American groups? You saw Tom Fleischner's picture up here and a, a brief word and a lot of data from him. When I asked him, uh, Professor Fleischner, where should we go for good information about how to manage this landscape? And remember, he spent his whole career looking at this. He said, if I were to draw up a blueprint for repurposing these public lands away from industrialization and toward preservation of natural systems, I would ask Native Americans first. I think there's a high level of respect for that kind of um, uh, tribal folklore wisdom um, that, science, that scientists respect who work in the field. But the other thing I would say is that uh, Native American tribes are also um, more and more aggressive, and I mean that in a positive way. Uh, uh, for instance, in filing suit, five tribes have gathered together to file suit against President Trump. 
uh, for what he's done to Bears Ears and the other national monuments. So I think we're seeing more and more of that on, on both fronts, legal and uh, science. Yeah. We are at the hour, and I know there's several other events. Those of you who were still trying to get questions asked, uh, please come up and also know that we are going to adjourn to the cellar, to the back room. Please feel free to join us for dinner there. That's on me. And once again, give me a big, uh, help me with a big thank you to Steve. Thanks, everybody.